Hey, everybody. Sorry about that. A little bit of a technical glitch there. Uh, got started and then we turned off. Uh, totally my fault. So, so thank you, everybody, for joining today. Uh, you have made it into the less than supervised learning for fundamental physics discovery session, uh, part of Clarify's Perceived Conference. So my name is Kyle Martinowicz, and I am Clarify's VP of Partnerships and Strategic Alliances, and I will be your moderator today. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping mentions. All attendees will hope to be muted, um, but we encourage you to ask questions, which you can do. On the top right-hand corner, there's a Q&A widget, uh, and you can add your questions uh, to there. And as the moderator at the end, I will answer all questions after the session, uh, which will be about 30 minutes. Um, today's session, as with all sessions, will be recorded and made available to all attendees at the end of the event. So without uh, further addition, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Benjamin Nachman. He's the staff scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Um, he received his PhD in physics and a PhD in minor statistics from Stanford in 2006. Um, this year, he is part of the Chamberlain Fellow Program, and you can find more information about his work at bpnockman.com, and I will put that into the chat. I suggest you also follow him on LinkedIn. He's got great content. Um, for anyone that doesn't know about Clarify, uh, we are the leading independent provider of AI for unstructured image and video data. Um, our end-to-end -end computer vision and NLP platform covers the entire AI lifecycle. A uh, company was started in 2013 by our CEO, Matt Zeeler, after winning five uh, top places at ImageNet. Uh, we continue to advance our work in uh, AI and recently opened our headquarters here in New York and then continued offices in DC, San Francisco, and Talon. Uh, and that's it from me. Again, any questions, please put them in the chat. I'll answer them or I will moderate at the end on how to get them answered. But I'm gonna leave it there and Ben, you can take over and I am incredibly excited to learn about some physics today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You got um, it. So today, be, yeah, this, this talk, I think maybe be a little bit different than what you've heard in other parts of this, uh, interesting conference, but I, I hope that maybe it'll be interesting and I'm happy to discuss uh, further at the end. So uh, I have to start by uh, first motiva motivating the physics after all, I'm a physicist and that's um, what uh, drives this research program. And so really uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, and deep questions in fundamental physics that motivate um, exploration of fundamental st the fundamental structure of nature. And here are just a few of the questions um, for instance, you may have heard of the Higgs boson, which was the which was discovered in 2012 and, and shortly thereafter won the Nobel Prize. Um, its mass is is very peculiar, peculiar and has uh, motivated a lot of interesting um, theoretical inquiry. And there are other related questions too. For instance, uh, if you ever looked up what a neutron looks like, so a neutron, neutrons and protons make up all the atoms that are around us. And you know, neutron itself is made of quarks, um, and it's made of two up quarks, two down quarks, and an up quark. And many pictures look like this one on the left, um, but actually, it turns out the neutron looks more like the picture on the right, and we we don't really understand why. But in addition to these theoretical questions, there are deep experimental questions. Um, for instance, you may have heard about dark matter. So most of the matter in the universe turns out to be not the matter that is that we're made out of, and we don't understand what it is. This dark matter uh, is very mysterious. And um, we know it, it interacts gravitationally, but other than that, we, we know very little about it. And there are other interesting puzzles as well. For instance, um, why do neutrinos have a mass? So neutrinos are um, very uh, light and mysterious particles, and um, they're uh, very elusive. They, most of the neutrinos go through the entire Earth without interacting with anything. And so it's very hard to, to detect them and study their properties, but their properties that we, we have understood so far are quite mysterious. Okay, but despite these very deep theoretical and experimental questions, um, you know, we performed thousands of hypothesis tests since the discovery of the Higgs boson, for instance, and since then there has been no significant evidence for new particles or new forces. But we haven't found anything new yet. So that tells me that there's sort of three possibilities. The first one is that there's nothing new with the accessible uh, energies at existing and near-term uh, experiments. The second possibility 
is that we just need to wait longer. The new physics is there. Uh, the, new, the current experiments are sensitive. We just need to wait until we reach the level of sensitivity by collecting more data. But there's a third possibility, which is that there is new physics. It's there, but we're not looking in the right place for it. And really, this is what drives um, my research program and is what I want to tell you a bit more about um, in today's talk. OK, so the experiment that um, one of the, the experiment I work on is based at the Large Hadron Collider, um, which is a, a giant proton-proton uh, collider in, in Geneva, Switzerland. And many of these deep questions in fundamental physics can be probed with the Large Hadron Collider. Now, one uh, co collision event is sort of shown schematically in this picture here, uh, which is definitely not to scale, sort of spans many orders of magnitude and length scales where two protons collide and the constituents of those protons interact with each other and outflies uh, many other particles which themselves interact and radiate and then eventually hit our detector and are measured with, in, with um, various uh, layers of detectors. And this is a really, this, this is a really exciting uh, um, opportunity but also a big challenge. So in a given collision event, for instance, might have thousands of particles. Each of those particles has uh, a momentum and other properties. And so you can easily live in some variable length, thousand, you know, high dimensional um, feature space. And then we detect all those particles with, which, with, with a detector, which is essentially um, a hyperspectral camera. So we have many, many layers of detector, of detector, detector units. And you know, the, the detector has something like 100 million readout channels. And so the combination of this big feature space and the big uh, 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 detector uh, really is a, a complex data challenge. OK, so here's uh, what a collision event might look like at the Large Hadron Collider, uh, where we collide uh, protons, say in this case, proton coming from the left, coming from the right. They interact in the middle, and then out goes the debris, a uh, cl collision debris, which are a series of particles that then um, hit our detector. So these orange lines correspond to reconstructed charged particle trajectories, and the green and yellow blobs are energy deposits in our calorimeter. And very rarely, we might be able to convert the energy of those protons into new massive particles via E equals mc squared. And so we want to be able to inspect the collision debris to infer if there was something new and exciting. And the current uh, search program for new particles, the usual way it works is that we'll posit some uh, uh, new theory that will extend the standard model of particle physics by introducing some new particles or some new forces. And then given that, uh, that model, we can simulate everything about that theory. And we can use those simulations combined with our physics knowledge to build dimensionality reduced feature sets that we can then study and look for new physics. In these kind of toy picture, this very complex final state is reduced down into a simple model with um, sort of ball and stick kind of objects that we're going to use for um, examining the features. But the question I want to ask is, can we relax these model assumptions in order to explore these high dimensional feature spaces and their, you know, the, so explore the, the, these data and their natural high dimensionality and also to be liberated from uh, model dependence. And I like to think about model dependence in sort of two, uh, two ways. So uh, it, an analysis has to do two things. One is that it has to achieve signal sensitivity. So we need a procedure that is sensitive to the presence of new particles or forces. But we also need to um, be able to know very well what is the background. So um, that is to say, how much noise do we have? Or what is the rate of standard model processes that could mimic our signal? And for each of these tasks, you can have a dependence on the, the, the signal model, you know, the, the one that you posited in the beginning, and also the background model. And so um, you, know, you could imagine all searches um, could be you know, a dot on both of these planes. And um, yeah, in our case, the, the background model is the standard model of particle physics. It's our current, current basically, theory of everything. OK, but let me focus on the left plane. And so yeah, most searches, as I mentioned before, sort of live in this bottom left corner. So you have posit some new model. You have a simulation of that model. You have a background model. You can simulate that. And you can use simulations of the signal of the background. They're fully labeled because it's simulation. And you could, for instance, create a classifier to distinguish the, the signal simulation from the background simulation. And that will allow you to have a very um, accurate and um, uh, effective search strategy. Now, there are some uh, searches which live sort of uh, off diagonal components here. Um, so for instance, there are some searches that directly use data for the background uh, by using calibration data, for instance, but still have signal models for the to simulation to, to simulate the signal to train a classifier. 
And there are also some searches which do sort of the opposite, which have, don't, don't have a signal model, but simulate the background and compare the background simulation to the data. And if those two are different, then, then you might have evidence for something new. But there's an, a, a whole new class of uh, searches which are starting to be um, proposed that live up in this top right part, that are a signal model and its background model independent as possible. And uh, they have um, some phony names. Some of them might look familiar. For instance, autoencoders are um, very popular um, generally for anomaly detection. But there are a variety of other approaches that um, have been tailored for particle physics because there are sort of specific needs and therefore um, uh, tailored approaches are, are really necessary. But as my title of my, my talk suggested, all of these approaches have something in common, which is that they do not use you know, the, a set of labeled data for um, simulation, for signal, and for background. They, they try to use less than supervised approaches, whether it's weakly supervised, semi-supervised, or unsupervised. And I want to tell you about one of those approaches for illustration. And um, it's based on um, one subtopic of weak supervision. So the idea is, can we learn um, to distinguish say signal from background when I have two data sets without labels, but um, I know I have these, these mixtures. So in the simple case, imagine I have a mixed set, two mixed samples where the samples are themselves composed of both signal and background. And I get to observe everything about these balls, for instance, except their color and the label. So, um, but, I, but I still want to be able to distinguish um, green from red, um, but I only get to observe everything aside from the color and the label. And one approach for doing this is called uh, classification without labels, uh, or uh, for short, um, koala. And the idea is, is incredibly simple. You simply uh, assert labels. So for instance, you call everything in mixed sample one a zero, and everything in mixed sample two a one. And then you can train your favorite fully supervised classifier to distinguish the zeros from ones. And then it's actually um, possible to show that you know, if enough training data, flexible enough, um, neural network, for instance, and also a, an efficient training procedure, that this uh, approach will, will converge to the optimal classifier for distinguishing red and green, which is pretty amazing because we're training a classifier here with way less information than a fully supervised classifier. And yet this approach is sort of um, uh, approaches that classifier. Okay, but this sort of tells you about training a classifier in general, but we want to do anomaly detection. So the question is, can we use this Koala protocol to search for new particles? And uh, because I'm answer asking this question, you know the answer is probably yes. And in fact, we call this um, approach uh, Koala hunting. And to be, to be clear, totally clear, um, uh, this Koala is being freed, not captured. So this is Koala's hunting, not hunting for Koalas. OK. Uh, and so the, the Koala hunting protocol proceeds as follows. So imagine um, that in your big feature space that you know ahead of time uh, that there's one dimension where uh, the background would be smooth, that is relatively featureless, and the signal, if it exists, would be localized. You don't have to know where it's localized, but you have to know that it would be localized somewhere. And this may seem like a pretty strong assumption, but uh, in many cases, you, you do know ahead of time that there's some special dimension where the signal would be localized. For instance, if you're looking for particles that have a well-defined mass, so some heavy new particle, the mass of that particle is resonant, is like a fixed number. And so if there's some observable that's sensitive to that mass, then that automatically gives you um, a feature that, that, that would satisfy this criteria. OK, so then once I have this um, setting, I can then construct my mixed samples to train the Koala classifier. And the way that works is that you, you simply you know, make a, a region around where the signal um, could be, and then you have a region right next to that, so a signal region and a sideband region. And then these two regions constitute the mixed samples. And then you can use whatever other features of these events that you have available to you. So all the features aside from the resonant feature, the localized one, um, that can be used to train a classifier. And in general, uh, we're going to we're going to combine these other features. Where here it's shown as one dimension, but in, in practice it's a high dimensional space. And you can use those to train a koala classifier, and then use that classifier to look for events that are different between the signal region and the sideband region. And that will be um, uh, hopefully give you sensi sensitivity to something new without saying ahead of time what the new thing um, is. So I'm going to demonstrate this um, in simulation to give you a sense for how this works. And the, the search that I'm going to use is called the, the, the DiJet search, the two-jet search. So this picture on the left 
is a cross section of one of the detectors at the LHC, the Atlas detector. And so the protons come into and out of the page. They collide right, right at the center of the slide. And then the collision debris goes out in all directions. And you can kind of see this um, onion-like structure, which are all the detector layers that are using, used to measure the various um, particles that go through the detector. And then these two uh, streams of particles, so each of those lines is a particle. And you can see there's sort of a red labeled stream of particles and a green labeled stream of particles. Those are called jets. And uh, you could imagine that there's some new particles, for instance, the famous question mark one particle, which could um, decay into other particles that then could decay into jets. And the idea is that the mass of the question mark one particle is a well-defined number. And so that will be the resonant feature. And so the mass of these two jets will be the resonant feature. And then all the properties of the jets, so the radiation pattern, the distribution of particles and their energies inside these two jets will be the features that we'll use to train the qual classifier. OK, um, so here I'm going to show you how it works. This is a very busy slide, but I'm going to use, reuse the same slide many, many times. And so first, let me tell you about the left plot. This is a, um, a histogram, basically, that shows in bins of mass of the two jets, it's the number of events that are observed in that bin. And this, this top line, this is the, so it says 100%. Uh, this is the, the, the um, a histogram where you don't apply any classifier. So it's just out of the box. And you can see the vertical um, dashed lines indicate the signal region and the sideband region. And that's going to be um, swept from left to right. But for a given signal region and sideband region, we, um, we can train the classifier. And then the idea is that for different cuts on that classifier, we, um, that, that corresponds to different lines here. So there's 100%, 10%, 1%, et cetera. So 10% says keep the 10% most signal region-like events according to the koala classifier. And then we want to know, is there evidence for something weird? And so in order to do that, we mask the signal region and we fit a parametric function outside of the signal region, that's this red dashed line, and interpolate it into the signal region. And then we compare the red dashed prediction to the blue points, which are the data. And if they're significantly different, then we have evidence for something new. If they're consistent, then we can say there's no evidence for something new. And the idea is that every time we do that, we can compute a p-value, the probability uh, a probability uh, of how strange the data is basically given the prediction. And this plot on the right is going to be our ledger. Where we're going to keep track of all these p-values. So for every threshold of the classifier, uh, we're going to have a different p-value. And then we're going to sweep from left to right. So for instance, you can see here uh, that the, the red dashed lines are basically all consistent with the blue um, circles in the, in the signal region. And so all the p-values are consistent with boring. That is to say, the probabilities are all very high. So there's no, so the there's no evidence for something new. Uh, something new would mean that the data are very inconsistent with the background prediction. And we can sweep the signal region from left to right. And you can see as I move uh, through the slide that the, the vertical dashed lines are moving from left to right. And on the right plot, our ledger is being filled out with p-values that correspond to all the various thresholds on the koala classifier. And as we go through, you see that um, uh, there's, no, there's not, no evidence for something new. All the p-values are consistent with boring. And that's good. It's necessary that a new algorithm for doing anomaly detection finds nothing when there's nothing. But that's not very interesting. That's not, that's not sufficient. So an algorithm is interesting, of course, if it can find something if there's something to find. And so we can inject a signal. And the signal here is some new particle called the W prime boson. And um, it decays into, say, other particles, which can decay into jets. And therefore, the search might be sensitive. And on the plot on the left, you see this yellow histogram. This corresponds what the signal would look like. So it's, as advertised, it's localized at some value. And that value is the mass of the new particle. But what's important is that the yellow histogram is much smaller than the 100% line. So if you didn't apply any classifier, um, the, the signal itself is something like you know, is, is many orders of magnitude, two orders of magnitude below the background. And so it'd be very hard to find that without doing anything, um, uh, without any machine learning. So we can apply the same procedure as before. So we'll sweep the signal region from left to right we once again have our ledger to keep track of p-values. And in the beginning, the p-values are once again boring. The signal region does not overlap with the peak of the signal. And the koala classifier says there's nothing, there, there are no special set of events that are different between the signal region and the sideband region. But then um, when the signal region overlaps with the peak of the signal, then all of a sudden the classifier says that there's actually a subpopulation of events which are very different between the signal region and the sideband region. And you can just see by eye on the left plot, actually, 
that um, the classifier is extremely efficient on the signal events, but it's very inefficient on the background. So basically you can see a bump by I that appears um, for very, let's say for instance at 0.2%, um, you can see that the blue dots uh, are peaked, whereas the prediction from the background um, from the interpolation is, is uh, smoothly falling. And so just by I, you can, you can see, but you can also calculate a p-value and, and the p-value here corresponds to something like seven sigma um, excess. Um, so something which is extremely inconsistent with the background only. And so, um, you know, we've taken a 1.5 sigma excess and amplified it to a seven sigma excess. And then once again, if we keep scanning, then the, uh, when the signal region no longer overlaps with the signal, then the, the p-values return um, to their uh, um, boring level um, as we had when we weren't overlapping with the signal. So to summarize, uh, when there's no signal injected, the p-values are consistent with boring and we find no evidence for something new in simulation. Uh, but then if we inject the signal, we can amplify an excess, which was roughly not interesting. So, you know, 1.5 sigma in the beginning, that's the black dashed line on the right plot. And then if we apply this koala classifier, it automatically learns to detect a set of events which are different in the signal region and the sideband region. And those events are very, that, that, that selection is very efficient for the signal and very inefficient for the background, even though we didn't tell the procedure um, what the signal looked like ahead of time. And it amplifies that 1.5 sigma excess to something like seven sigma. Okay, so I'm very excited to say that uh, this search has actually been uh, deployed um, in, in practice to data um, in, at the Atlas uh, experiment. And it's sort of been applied in a, in a simpler version where the feature space is relatively limited. Um, but nonetheless, we have our first results. And so this, this plot that's shown here is what's called an exclusion plot. So we ran the search and we didn't find any evidence for something new, but what we can do is we can inject the signal into the data and see if we would have seen it. And if we would have seen it, um, then we could say that signal must be excluded because if it had existed, we would have seen it. So the x-axis of this plot, there are many pr uh, numbers in parentheses. Those correspond to masses of various particles um, that we could have injected. And the y-axis is, is the um, limit on the, the rate of new particles. And the rate is measured in a, uh, what's called a cross-section and the units of cross-section are called femtobarn. It doesn't matter what that means, but uh, smaller values are better. So smaller values mean we're sensitive to a smaller rate. Okay, and um, right, this is an official uh, result from the Atlas collaboration. I'm gonna walk you through what it looks like. And so uh, this was based on data collected in the most recent run of the LHC, which was between 2015 and 2018. And uh, there are yeah, many parameters that you can set. Uh, and for instance, for, for you know, some certain set of parameters, you can, we can compute what is the cross section we would have seen. So we basically inject the signal and we adjust the rate of the signal until uh, we're just below the, 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 um, the rate that we would have seen it. And that must be the limit that we, that, that is our exclusion limit. That is the rate that we would exclude if it had existed. And we can repeat this for a large number of signals. So here, for instance, there are six signals. And uh, what's an important point, and I'll come to at the very end of my talk, is that for each uh, signal that we inject and for every rate of signal we inject, we have to retrain all the neural networks because the procedure learns directly from data. We don't tell ahead of time what, what the signal looks like. So if there was a different amount of signal, the data would have looked different and therefore the classifier, it, uh, the learned classifier would also be different. Okay, and uh, we can compare these results to other searches that are sensitive to similar signals. And um, it turns out that you know, we're brought, because of this uh, learning directly from the data, it's more sensitive than uh, searches that do not have any machine learning, um, but it's less sensitive for particular models where searches were developed for that particular model. So the red points are inclusive searches that were not targeted, so we're better than that. But the black cross is a search that was directly targeted, so fully supervised for the 80-80 point. And uh, the, the um, weekly supervised approach is a bit worse which I think is expected. Um, basically, you, you're more broadly sensitive, but for any particular signal, you can be less sensitive. Okay, and so yeah, this is the, uh, the first application of deep learning plus weak supervision plus anomaly detection for a real physics result um, uh, in practice. Okay, so the last thing I wanna say at the very end of my uh, talk today is to discuss about the computational challenges. So I have very briefly mentioned um, the, that we had to train many, many neural networks. And I wanna give you a sense for that. So there, are, as we sweep this region from left to right, there are sort of six signal regions that we used in this search. Uh, and we, we do some, some cross validation for each one of those regions in order to use all the data. We can't test and train on the same data, that's really important. 
Um, and so that's why we have to do this cross-validation. And there's also some ensembling because we found that is that we're looking uh, for a particularly weird case where our two, or our, our two mixed samples are almost exactly the same, and there might be just a tiny bit of signal in one of them. In particular, the kind of rates we're looking for are sort of 1% or 1 per mil uh, signal rates. So basically imagine training a classifier to distinguish two data sets that are almost 100% the same, except for you know, 1% or 1 per mil difference. And so all this ensembling where we have different validation sets and different initializations is really quite important. So for a given um, uh, pass with the analysis, it's something like a few hundred neural networks. But as I mentioned, we have to basically repeat this procedure for every time we inject a different signal model and every time we inject a different signal model cross-section, a different rate. And so we, in that plot I showed you, we had six different models. And for each of those, we do a pretty coarse scan in rates, which are sort of five rates. And so if you, if you imagine this 360 neural network box is sort of embedded in this bigger loop, by the time you're said and done, everything is said and done, there's sort of 10,000 neural networks we're, we're trained to make that plot. And this was okay for the relatively simple uh, neural networks that were used for this low dimensional feature space. But in the future, we want to extend this analysis to go to higher, higher dimensional feature spaces. And so then we're really gonna need to exploit um, uh, massive uh, computing resources. And this is very parallelizable. It's all you know, independent loops. Um, but in order to train very effectively, we're gonna need a lot of GPU resources and fortunately, this is really possible on the horizon with, with HPCs and other um, uh, computing, computing opportunities for us to deploy these methods in practice. All right, so that brings me to the end. Um, I, I hope I've convinced you that, that deep learning-based anomaly detection has a great potential for discovery. I've only covered one topic here, but there are a variety of new protocols that are being developed and deployed. And there's sort of a very interesting connection between uh, anomaly detection uh, that's you know, been deployed for industry and an anomaly detection that needs to be, uh, needs to be tailored for um, fundamental physics. And, and one um, sort of shout out is that we've actually developed a um, data set, a challenge data set that um, can be used to try deploying different um, anomaly detection methods. It's called the LHC Olympics. And you can see the link um, here uh, where we have some black box data sets and it's up to the, the um, Olympian to tell us what's inside those black boxes, if they're signal or not. And what are the properties? As we use more complex, less than supervised approaches, um, I also tried to tell you that we need a significant computing power to ensure this program is successful. And I think that this will be a very interesting interplay between um, methods, applications, and hopefully um, scientific delivery of new discoveries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ben. Super. I loved it. I loved hearing about the anomaly detection stuff. I think it's uh, quite amazing to be able to find classes out of nothing. I think that is uh, such a great thing for the future of deep learning that uh, uh, for unsupervised learning too, it's really great. Um, we have some questions popping in. Um, I'm gonna just uh, take the first one from Chen Chao. It says, how sensitive is the classifier to ad adversarial examples? Um, and then how do you distinguish adversarial false positives from new physics? That's a good question. So, so first of all, um, I, would, we, I think we generally assume that nature is not evil. And so because we're learning directly from data, there's no adversary in the sense of someone trying to mess with our neural networks to, uh, you know, to, to um, fool them. However, there are a variety of um, uh, failure modes of these approaches. And uh, one particular failure mode, which I, I didn't spend much time talking about, is imagine when we're comparing the signal region and the sideband region in this particular um, application, imagine that there is a, um, there's actually a real difference um, when there's no signal between the two. So that is to say, um, the features that you're, you're using to classify are actually correlated with the resonant feature. So in that case, your classifier will just learn that instead of learning to look for signal. And it turns out this is actually really quite related to um, fairness. And there have been some new methods developed in high energy physics um, to train classifiers that are independent of for certain features. So in this case, imagine you want to train your koala classifier that's independent of the resonant feature. And you can think of that in the relationship to fairness is like, you know, imagine I want to train a classifier that's independent of say like um, age or uh, socioeconomic status. So it, it, there's actually a very tight connection between those kind of, of tools and the, and the tools you have to use here to be robust to that kind of um, uh, failure mode. Great, thank you. And then Chen Chao also asked, do neural network models outperform single class SVM models? Yes, so um, we're trying to explore here large feature spaces where there's sort of complex and structured um, uh, patterns from, from, the, from the signals. And, and yes, the, 
the neural networks are able to outperform simpler, shallower um, classifiers. Okay. Is there a is there a number of suppression signals that you can add into into this process? So if you're looking for signals that don't exist, and you said that you can keep out signals that already exist, or you can determine signals that already exist. Is there too many signals that already exist to affect the processing or the output that you're going to get? Yeah, so in this particular search, the, there are no anomalies that we know about that we should find. And so really everything, if, we've seen, if we see anything, it'll be new. Um, and so uh, one, of the, one of the challenges that we really face is that it's hard to say what you didn't find. Um, and so uh, we're probing this big um, space but it's hard to know what are the boundaries of that space. So for a usual search, you posit a model, you look for that model. If you didn't find it, you say, I didn't find that model. But here, we're not targeting a particular model. So one of the computational challenges is a whole list of models we could be sensitive to. And we have to try to convey somehow where we were kind of sensitive. And that's this plot I showed. You know, We picked six random models um, that sort of probed the boundaries of this space. But it's sort of not totally sufficient to show where we're, where we're, where we're sensitive. And as the feature spaces get bigger, we're more and more sensitive. And so there are more anomalies that we could be sensitive to. But it's hard to sort of convey that in a, in a you know, succinct plot like this. What happens if it's part of a multi-class or a hierarchy of class? Yeah, so one very interesting uh, potential is that imagine you have some new particles that have, say, decay in different ways. Um, and so you might have like one particle, and it has like different what are called branching ratios. And traditional searches are very insensitive to that. And we haven't explored that yet for these weakly supervised approaches, but I, I'm hopeful that actually they could be sensitive when your signal is actually itself a multi-class. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. Good. Have you seen any applications outside of physics in the enterprise yet? Maybe uh, predictive maintenance or some sensor detection where we're trying to understand why a piece of hardware would break or machine would break and there's so many different reasons why it might break. Yeah, so we've also seen um, anomaly detection used not only for searching for new particles, but even in physics for, like, for instance, detector operations, like looking for, you know, trips in high voltage supplies and other kinds of problems um, in accelerator um, uh, performance and various other things. And the way I like to think about it is there's sort of two kinds of anomaly detection. One, where you're looking for um, wherever where you, you see an example and you know it's an anomaly. And so that's sort of like out of distribution anomalies. So if you see, like you saw a flying elephant, you know, you only need to see one flying elephant to know it's weird, right? But the kind of anomalies we're looking for here in the physics case are more like over densities. So it's sort of like there are a few more elephants than there should be at the local watering hole. And that, that requires really understanding very well what is the probability density of elephants at the watering hole, as opposed to having you know, approach that just says, here's a weird thing. And if you examine it by eye, you say, yeah, it's definitely weird. And so I think a lot of, a lot of uh, anomaly detection, for instance, for like uh, looking for weird things in detectors, that's sort of off manifold. You see one example, you know that you know it is. But a lot of the things we're looking for from the physics side require having a really good density estimation as well. Okay. Um, I think that is it for questions on the back end. Um, again, uh, you'll everyone will get a recording uh, of this session. We certainly appreciate your time, Ben. Uh, super informative. I love the anomaly detection stuff. Uh, physics is one of those things that people don't understand that uh, is such a huge part of data science research. And I'm glad you got to bring it to our audience today. Um, again, follow Chris. I'll put in the link to, uh, there it is, to the two things, which is for his own work. And then the second one, which is the LLHC Olympics. Anyone who would like to go out there and try to find out what's in the black box, do it and uh you know let's see what we all come up with um thank you very much you got it ben thanks everybody and have a great day